you live, local. It's the Chris Stagall Show. say that this slate of candidates this year has a far hipper music uh, lineup behind them. Everybody has their own uh, music theme. Very well produced this year. Ron Paul is, I think he might be the last of the candidates in the Republican field that have either been in it or dropped since that have appeared on the Chris Stigall show, but we're glad he's here now. He was in Philadelphia on Sunday in a driving rain and thousands of people turned out to hear him. Pennsylvania primary today and he's on the ballot. And uh, Congressman Paul joins us now. Congressman, good morning. Glad you made time for us today. Good morning. Nice to be with you. Uh, Pennsylvania, you came here. I, you know, I thought it was interesting. There aren't many people that do what you did, and I think that's to their detriment. You you made the appropriate call to come to Philadelphia and stand on Independence Mall. And shouldn't that be where every Republican focuses a lot of uh, his or her energy, I think, going forward? You, you would think so. It's inspirational to be there. We were there four years ago and had a big, big turnout in the other campaign, and we were always hoping to do a lot better, but somebody told me I should be quite satisfied to get about 4,300 out in that, in that weather. <laughs> so it was pleasing, but I think it's inspirational. It inspires the supporters, but it certainly helps me, too, to, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, generate interest and, and uh, excitement. And so we were very pleased. I mean, it's such a historic place. How many of your colleagues would you guess, if you had to give it a percentage, 400, uh, what, 35 members of the House and 100 right. senators, how many of them would you guess in a percentage-wise have even been to Independence Mall? Oh boy, I I don't know that. But uh, if you were to guess, you think even half of them? I would say I would say ten percent, but I don't know that for sure. Isn't that you know sad? That? Not enough is my point. Yeah, no, no, not enough at all. I mean, I've gone through that thing so many times, Congressman, and I it, it is it's inspiring. And and you're a guy, you're a constitutional guy, and to read the the whole premise and the basis for which those documents were created, it, it's uh, it, it is a good reminder, isn't it? Oh, I, absolutely. It refreshes our memory. But it really uh, it talks to the point, and I talked a little bit about that in my talk, you know, about we're trying to change things in a revolutionary way, and, and that is exactly what they were doing. There was an intellectual revolution. Actually, for not a, a year or two before the revolution, you know, the original revolution, but for 100 years, you know, it was intellectual. They, uh, they, they, they knew the classics, uh, and, and they brought that together finally and, and had political political action. So I think <clears throat> I tried to try to draw the analogy that this has been going on for us who would like to restore the atmosphere of what occurred, you know, at our original revolution so that we can not so much go back to where we were as to pick up the pieces and improve upon it, you know, whether it's whether it's the gold standard or the understanding of personal liberty or understanding of the free market or refining our foreign policy. The founders of this country had a lot to say about foreign policy, and, and we've sort of forgotten about uh, we've got way off on a tangent. Congressman, what um, historically, and I know you have an understanding of this, one of the most fascinating relationships I, I like to read about or study is Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Alexander Hamilton and, and Thomas Jefferson did not get along. And I, I suspect if you were around at that time, you wouldn't be nuts about Alexander Hamilton either. Did he have a use and a function? The founder, the founder of modern banking, which didn't give us the Fed, but, you know, he was, he was a central banking guy. Do you fundamentally disagree with the whole concept? Oh, ab absolutely, because, uh, you know, he was instrumental in getting the first bank started, and Jefferson got rid of it. Yeah. So they didn't call it a central bank, but it was the first uh, first national bank, and that was that was the idea of central banking. So, yeah, no, the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians have been arguing ever since, and I have always identified with, with Jefferson, and, uh, of course, uh, as far as uh, popularity goes over the many several centuries, uh, Jefferson has always come out. Time. We don't have a great monument in Washington D.C. for Hamilton. Yeah, but are you a, are you a pro in terms of the banking structure? The idea of it being a one national currency versus multiple state currencies? You don't oh, have a problem. Oh with no, that. they they did have a problem to deal with. There yeah. was no doubt about it. The states were you know printing money you know at different rates, and it was chaotic. And that was one of the reasons they really were in recession. They weren't doing well after the revolution, and and it was the interstate trading problem as well. Was the currency problem that the convention was supposed to settle, 
and uh, and and they did come up with a monetary issue that we would have a unified currency, but not, the states would no longer they're prohibited from printing money, you know, mm-hmm. and inflating a currency and, and constantly debating currency, and that the currency of the nation had to be defined as a precise weight of, of silver, and uh, the but it did not authorize the central bank and it prohibited the central government from printing money as well. All they could do was mint gold and silver coins. So the the directions are pretty precise. So and it's, then, of not, course, it's not a universal currency you had trouble with. It's just the it's the printing of money, the inflation. Well, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. A universal currency. If it and, and uh, the metals came about over thousands of years is not because government decided it was this, it was that the people who, as they left the barter economy, they decided it was more efficient to have a universal commodity yeah. that served as money. So money developed in a natural way. So when governments come in and they want to print the money, they're bucking a natural tendency of a solution that the people came up without an edict, without a fiat, without a declaration. But governments notoriously have always wanted power. So whether it were the uh, the pharaohs of the old age or the Roman emperor, emperors, they, they always want more power. They want a monopoly over the printing and the creation of money, and, and that is where we are. And this monopoly became concrete on August 15th in 1971. It was the day I was motivated to say, you know, we have embarked on a course that's going to lead to a financial disaster in this country, yeah. and that it would, you know, cause a tremendous increase in the size of the federal government. So the last 40 years have been pretty bad for us as a country. Congressman Ron Paul's with us. One of my favorite moments for you uh, during this whole primary season was when someone asked you kind of the hypothetical question about this young, healthy kid who was uninsured, didn't buy insurance, and then you know, had a really, I don't remember who, what, who which moderator, moderator it was, but the, the question was directed toward you as a doctor, a former doctor. And, you know, here's a young kid who has no health insurance and then he has a calamitous, ruinous disaster, either an illness or an accident or something. Who's going to pay for it? And shouldn't we have a, a sympathetic system in place to take care of this kid? And, and you very simply said, and this is a focus not much talked about, You very, once upon a time, you said as a doctor, there were things known as churches and charities that helped do things like that. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes, and because I had actually, uh, you know, practiced medicine under those conditions. It was a shame that, you know, they were able to distort that and make it and made it look like not only that I, but others who might agree with me that we were heartless and cruel. But it is exactly the opposite. I talk a lot about, you know, the free market system and sound money is more humanitarian than where we give up our rights and, and go to the nanny states. And that's always motivated by humanitarian instincts. And they turn it around and, make th- and they say that we don't care. But if you really care about people being taken care of and uh, having good jobs and been able to eat and have a house and have medical care, you have to opt for the free market. I mean, the, the extreme of socialism doesn't take care of these people either. You wait in line for two or three years and people die and they don't even get recorded. And we're moving in that direction. So the humanitarian instinct is um, uh, opting for uh, opting for freedom is a, is much a better place to go. But uh, it's my, one of the major things that we as conservatives and libertarians have to address uh, because the, the do-gooders get grabbed the moral high ground it's sort of like well, well how much good did they do for those houses they were providing for the poor people well the rich got bailed out and the poor people lost their houses yeah so and you know work. there's this great discussion now july 1st that uh, student the stafford loans uh, and and student obama's out there saying you know and, and and romney sort of doubled down on this too yesterday which bugged me saying that we need to keep these student loan rates low and locked low and you, you have a lot of youth support out there particularly among college kids but you've never once that I've ever heard uh, been a big uh, federally subsidized student loan guy. Am I correct? I, absolutely not, because I think that created the problem. You pump more, you get more people to go to universities, and the money is there. And guess what happens? Uh, does the quality of education go up? You get maybe more with degrees, but the cost goes up. This is what happens in medicine. You pump money into medicine, you don't get better quality, you get higher prices. So it, it always backfires. So we we created this um, seductive system where more people could go to college, cost goes up. So the government said, oh, the costs are going up, not because of inflation, but just for some other evil reason. So they said, we're going to give you more money and give you an easy loan. So the students finally get their degree and they come out 
and they owe $40,000, and they can't get a job. So it's a deeply flawed system. When I went to college, I could work on weekends in the summer and pay all my bills. Can I ask you something? And I, I, just, I don't – maybe you're going to disagree with this. I've watched all these primary debates, and, and you have – you've you've pretty aggressive. Every time somebody's kind of come to the front of the pack, you've taken it to them in the debates, and, and you know, good for you. That's the way the whole primary process works. But there's one guy, in my judgment – who you've really never leveled any real criticism of, and that's Mitt Romney. And I'm just curious if, one, if you think that's accurate, and two, why that is. It's, there is a difference. Uh, but, you know, my ads, we've put ads out, and we've included him, and we've hit him on the flip-flopping and things. And, uh, and people ask me this a whole lot, and I said, uh, you know, I do get along with him better. He is. Uh, he is. A, we're better friends than the rest. Uh, but philosophically, we have essentially no agreements. I mean, his foreign policy is different. His, he doesn't care about the Fed. He spends too much money. His civil liberties position is not mine. But, you know, we can't deny that I've gotten to know him over these past four years. We know, my wife and I know his wife, and they have five kids, and we have five kids. So it's, uh, it's probably, it's, it's probably a, 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 a friendship that doesn't encourage me to confront. But, Philosophically, I haven't been I haven't been bashful about pointing out our differences because people say, "Well, could he be in your administration, or would he put you in his administration?" I said, "Not likely. You know, it's not going to happen." The, the, the thing I struggle with as a talk host, and I try my level best to be respectful of all the Republican primary candidates' supporters, and you have many of them, and they're rabid. And there are going to be thousands of them that eventually, if Romney becomes the nominee, they're deflated, they're dispirited, they feel like you do. You don't see eye to eye with him on virtually anything. Maybe they'll sit at home. And I would ask you then, do you say to your supporters, look, if I'm not the nominee, let's let's beat Barack Obama at all costs. Please don't sit out and pout. Is that your position? No, hardly. I'm not presumptuous to think that, you know, I'm instrumental and I'm playing a role but it's a lot different uh, for me. I, I just don't say that, you know, I make the declaration. Just say I lose, I, I lose the nomination, and I say, all right, folks, uh, because there's a, a lot more than a few thousand, because the independents and the Democrats who don't vote in the Republican primary are very supportive, and we do, we actually tie uh, Obama, you know, in a, in, in a polling. Right. No, I, it would be so presumptuous for me to say, okay, everybody vote for Romney. I would lose credibility. And they probably wouldn't do it. I, my, it, I don't think it would help Romney, and uh, so uh, that's that's not likely to happen. But uh, it's still, you know, early. And, and I always say, and this is almost a negative thing that who knows? Uh, some of these views might change. You know, Romney has changed before. Maybe he will. The, the, one of the two big issues I've worked on for thirty years has been the monetary issue and the foreign policy. I think foreign policy is so detrimental to us. I just can't stand the idea of all the killing and the waste and the no. water, looking at these veterans coming back and the suicide uh, epidemic we have and all the ones that have lost their limbs. This is just to be, I think the foreign policy is deeply flawed. So I'm waiting and seeing what see what happens. Could I, could I just kind of zero in on the central question, though, Congressman? Is there a dime's worth of difference then between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, in your view? Is there a dime's worth of difference between the Democrat Party and the Republican Party? You're running as a Republican. And yet I kind of tend to hear you say, I'm sort of the standard barrier and everybody else, Republican or Democrat, are all part and parcel of the well, same thing. Most of, most of our supporters uh, have come to that conclusion. Not so much on the rhetoric. Uh, How about you? No. Well, I, I, if I look at history, no, there's no no significant difference. Look, I was a great champion and pushed Reagan in 76 on. But, uh, you know, the deficits exploded. Bush, Bush got in. We had the Republicans and the Democrats. Bush doubled the size of the Department of Education. He gave us prescription drug programs. Yeah. And the wars accelerated, even though he ran on the position of a humble foreign policy. So th there isn't a whole lot of difference. But if you say, is there a dime's worth of difference? Maybe there's a nickel's worth of difference. Because <laughs> yeah. but maybe ne ne uh, Romney, Romney is going to be better on taxes. I believe him when he tells us that. But who knows what's going to happen? Bush said he wouldn't bring no new taxes, but he lost his election, you know, because he gave us new taxes. 
But uh, so uh, if you look at overall, the, the people in charge of the Republican and the Democratic Party have the same foreign policy. They have the same monetary policy. They believe in the entitlement system. They don't worry that much about deficit. What other candidate other than myself has actually said have real cuts the first year? And, of course, mine is a cut a trillion dollars. I think this debt problem, this debt bubble we have is much more serious than anybody's willing to admit. Congressman, why do you run as a Republican? Why not just run as an independent? Because we don't have a democratic system in this country. Uh, if I ran as an independent, uh, I might not even be on your show. You, you probably would let me be on your show, but, you know, the, I wouldn't be in debates. You, I mean, do you think the third-party people are going to be in debates? No. Mm-hmm. If you had a billion dollars, you might be able to compensate. Getting on the ballots, really, really tough. And the Republicans and the Democrats write all the rules. You know, what bugs me is we go overseas, we send young people, over and they die, so to speak, to spread democracy and have elections. They finally have some elections overseas and we ignore them because we don't like the people they elect. At the same time, we don't have a fair democratic process here. You must work within the major parties and if you come to this conclusion that they're the same, this is the mess that uh, we, we get into. So I I don't see that there's there's a whole whole lot of difference. I, I just think that the, uh, the process is is a philosophic struggle. We can work our way out of this if we change it. And this is what I think we're doing in our campaign, because half of my support, if you do a national poll, comes from non-Republicans. Do you want to Uh, see the Republican Party reformed, or do you just want to do away with parties? I want to see the country reformed. I want to see uh, an economic policy uh, and property rights and monetary policy reformed. I want both parties to change their foreign policy. And I refer a lot to Nixon's statement in the early 70s when he got us off the gold standard. He says, well, we're all Keynesians now. Well, I don't want any of us to be Keynesians. I think it's, I think it's a deeply flawed economic system. It invites all this uh, monetary manipulation and fixing of interest rates and deficits. They believe in deficits. I mean, if you listen to Paul Krugman or Bernanke, these people think you should spend more money and print more money in a time of a crisis that was caused by too much spending and too much debt and too much printing of money. So that has to be reversed, and it is not a partisan issue. You told CNBC yesterday, this is a quote I'm reading, if tomorrow Romney had the absolute number of delegates, I would probably continue in a modified way to maximize the number of delegates to go to the convention. So you do intend to just soldier on to the convention. Oh, yeah. I I mean... uh, why drop out of a race that's still going and nobody's finished the, uh, finished the line? So, so to that end, you support what Gingrich is doing, too, yes? Yeah, but um, I don't support deficit financing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in terms of this notion of people should just get out of the way and let Romney Oh, have, what, like I mean, it. what kind of system is that? Be, you know, they've been doing that for three months now, yeah. bugging all the candidates to say, oh, get out, get out. Well, what kind of a system is that one? Who you would know, you say like, of this entire slate, if you had to pick, and I know you're asked this question a lot, but who uh, would you say of this entire slate of candidates from the beginning, would you say you most closely identified with in policy? Politically. No, I think they're all the same. Every I think one they're of them. all I think they're all interventionists. They were all they all they were trying to outdo themselves on being more aggressive in starting the next war. Who could be the toughest? Uh, they none of them were open to the idea that maybe we ought to talk to the Cubans and have trade with Cuba. <laughs> I mean, they were all love sanctions. So besides uh, your besides your son, is there anyone in the Republican Party in Congress with whom you I, uh, agree with most ideologically? Probably Justin Amash, but there's quite a few that I agree with on some very important issues. You take a Dennis Kucinich, I agree with him. We agree with each other and work together on foreign policy and civil liberties. Uh, Justin Amash is uh, very, very close. He's a young uh, uh, congressman from Michigan. And there's a lot of them who have bits and pieces. There are some who are very, very good on economic policy, and some are very, very good on civil liberties. I say the freedom message brings people together by protecting your personal liberty and your economic liberty instead of having two pieces of liberty uh, together. And if you come to this conclusion, then you have a foreign policy that says the foreign policy should give a strong national defense and we shouldn't be in nation building and uh, getting involved in the internal affairs of other nations, which was is a strong advice by our founders well, uh, as they spoke so often in the city of Philadelphia. And that, Congressman, is uh, you know one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on. I was, uh, I was impressed and frankly pleased to see that you chose that venue. I I think that's an important venue, and uh, you know thousands turned out in the rain to see you. 
speak there. So I'm glad you highlighted that place. I wish more would. And, and look, uh, we're going to be in Tampa in August. So if you're planning on being there, we'll be there. Hope we can talk to you again. That'd be nice. Thank you, Congressman Paul. Thank you. Mornings 530 tonight. Wake up with Chris Stagall on Philadelphia's Talk Radio 1210.